Hello and welcome to Second Look, a midweek Bible study of Second Baptist Church here in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. My name is Brother David Tucker. I'm pastor here, and I'm excited that you and I are going to spend some time together right now studying God's Word. Now, we're going to be looking in Psalm 91. This is known as the Warrior Psalm. And You'll note as the clip begins that this is not a present day study that we've just finished. It's actually one that goes back. And if you wanted to look on YouTube, you could find where we did the full study of Psalm 91. One of the reasons that I love this Psalm and I love this study is because it calls to us about the protection of God and the courage we should receive in having God in our life. To be able to engage in the battle that this world gives to us. So I hope that you'll enjoy this study as we take a second look at a second look Bible study on Psalm 91. But before we get any further into studying this word, let's stop and pray to the author of this word and ask for him to give us insight. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the privilege of being in your house. And Father, I thank you most of all for the privilege of your word. Lord, you have given us your scripture and in it you speak. And so Lord, I pray that you will lead us in all that we study here tonight, that you will allow us to hear your voice, hear your conviction, hear your calling. And Father, I pray that we will respond to you with humility and faithfulness. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we dig into this passage, I want to remind you just a little bit because each week we have different folks who might tune in. And so I always want to bring everybody up to speed. So we're all working off the same page as we jump in together. Um, last week, we discussed a few simple things. One was the context of the passage. Um, it is about our God as a fighting God. And a lot of folks would say, well, the Bible does not teach us that God is a fighting God. God doesn't believe in fighting at all you know, turn the other cheek and all of that other stuff. But when you go through the whole of the Old Testament and the whole of the New Testament, what you find out is that God does fight with us. He does fight for us. We see that in Exodus chapter 15 with Moses and Miriam. We see it in Zechariah in chapter 10. We see it in Isaiah chapter 42. We see it again and again and again where God says, I will step into the fray to be with my people. And so that's important to note that the Bible doesn't tell us that God is a spectator just watching us suffer or hurt. He is not a spectator who simply is, is hands off and says, I don't care. Our God is one who gets into the ring with us. If you're getting beat up, he, he's feeling those blows and those hits. He is hurting with you as you hurt in the midst of the struggle. And so our God is a fighting God. He steps into the ring with us. And the scripture tells us in this passage that he will fight sometimes for us, protect us, pull up those gloves and, and keep the blows from landing. He is capable and able to help us come through the fray. So tonight, whatever the battle is that you're in, I want you to know that there is a God who not only loves you, but he is with you in this struggle. Now, the second thing we want to mention is that this passage is built around the statements of four different individuals, three of whom are true and the fourth, which is false. And that is in verses one and two, you have the testimony of the psalmist. And that's what we're going to dive into tonight. That's what we're going to talk about a lot tonight. But then after that, you have down at the end of the chapter, beginning there in verse 13, or actually verse 14, you have the statements of God himself. So you have the statements of the psalmist, a follower of God. Then you have the statements of God as he makes promises to those of us who choose to follow him. And then in the middle from verses three through 13, you have these promises that are applied to you and me as the reader or listener of this passage. And it hinges around that verse nine, where it says, if you will, if you say, in other words, when you and I commit what's being discussed in this passage, then becomes the possibility for our life. But without the commitment, the possibility is removed. And so we need to recognize that very, very clearly. The first thing that is important in this passage, and we noticed this last week as we dove into it, is that 
if we haven't committed ourselves to God, then God has not committed himself to us. You and I have an opportunity to respond to him and, and engage with him, but he will not force himself on us. We must choose to invite him into our lives. Now, with that said, there is a fourth individual that uses this passage, and that is Satan himself. And what he does is he takes this passage and he twists it out of context and uses it to actually tempt Christ over in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, he's using Scripture, but he's using it in an evil way. Is, is that even possible? Yes. The scripture that God has given us, the word that he has given us is solid, it's true, it's beautiful. But like so many things, mankind can take that which God has given and we can actually twist it and force it into something that it was never meant to do. Now, we can do that in the realm of Christianity to push people into a faith that is more positive thinking than it actually is the person of Jesus Christ. Or we can take the scripture and twist it to actually say that some sins are not really sins because of the way we interpret what the scripture has to say. We're taking the scripture then and we're twisting it to what we want it to do instead of allowing the scripture do what it must in us. So when you and I approach this passage, it is so important especially with the beautiful promises that are laid out, for us not to discount them and say, no, 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 they're clearly just all false. They're not real. And also not to make more of them than what the promise really is. What we have to do is we have to find the truth and then cling to it. Now, the last piece to this, and I want to repeat it tonight, is that I have talked with individuals who have had this passage come to life for them. And we're going to discuss that as we discuss the witness of those who have seen the protection of God. But I want you to understand there's an intensity that occurs when one is using this passage and is in the midst of the fray versus the intensity that you might feel when you're reading about that battle, but you're not in the middle of that struggle. I've read about war, but I have never had to go to war. I have read about many diseases, but I've never battled those particular diseases. I have a knowledge, there's no question about it, and I have some experience, but my experience and my knowledge is not the same and doesn't carry the same passion or connection as those who have been in the midst of the struggle. And so when you and I read this passage, you may talk with somebody who, who sees it or hears it with a little more intensity than you might. And that is perfectly acceptable because you haven't been where they have. You've not walked a mile in those shoes and, and you don't know what it's like to face the darkness of the night that they have walked through. And so this passage may speak to them in a different way to some degree. But the main thing is, no matter whether we have lived through that struggle or not lived through that struggle, as we come to the passage, we have to let the passage say what it says and not read into it or force into it what we want it to say. So with all that said, let's jump back into Psalm 91, the warrior psalm. And let's begin there in just the first two verses, because in that we find the testimony of the psalmist. In my translation, the NIV, it reads this way. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Now, in the King James, it reads this way. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. So in the NIV, in the King James, there's a slight variation in the reading. But here's the thing that I want you to take note of. 
And that is in that verse two, there are these four statements, okay? He is a refuge, a fortress, a God, and trustworthy. Those four things come out in both translations. They're abundantly clear. And so if you take and you start to boil that down, what you recognize is the psalmist is writing, whether in the King James or in the NIV, that God is, is more than just a place. He is a person. And that person is engaged in sheltering him. Now, I don't know how it was you were growing up, but um, I've seen enough kids and my guess is when I was a kid, I was not far off from these, that when somebody who is big and tall and strange, like myself, and I walk up to a child that doesn't know me, the child will often back up and slide behind a parent. Sometimes they'll be grabbing hold of a trouser leg or, or the hem of a dress, but they will back up and they will slide behind a parent. Now, the parent is not a concrete block wall. The parent is is not a steel reinforced room, but the child has a belief that this person is not only on their side, but will actually shelter them from whatever may come. It is a natural and true feeling for every child. When they see trouble, they slide in behind that which they believe is the protection. And that protection is not a thing it is a person. So for you and me, as we fight the battles that we fight, God wants us to know he's not a thing. It's not the force from Star Wars. It is him. And he loves you. He created you. He designed you. He knows you. And his desire is to protect you. You say, well, if he wanted to protect me, then why would I be going through all these things? I can tell you without any doubt that God's desire is to protect. And the reason I know this is because he sent his own son to die for you, to protect you from the greatest harm, and that is hell. If he was willing to let his own son bleed and die for you and me, the scripture says in Romans, what else would he ever hold against us? Obviously, he is for us. But a lot of times when we get into the struggles, when we get into the hardships, when we are having the tough time, we begin to doubt whether or not God is on our side. We begin to doubt whether or not God is with us, especially if we have received a bruise or a cut in this battle. When, when we have a wound of some kind, our immediate assumption is God is not with me. But that's not necessarily true. God gave his own son to bleed and die for you. He loves you and he stands with you and he will fight with you in the struggle that you find yourself in. As a matter of fact, you don't have to just take my word for it. You can hear it from the psalmist mouth himself. The psalmist writes again, verses one and two, whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. He, here is this passage and this psalmist, who we make an assumption here that it is David, but it is not understood. It's just an assumption that we have made. That David is writing this psalm, and he is writing about the protection of God. Now, I want you to understand this. If David is the psalmist here, then he's stating in this, I have personally experienced the protection and the shelter of God. I give you my testimony. I give you myself as a witness. This is what God has done in my life. This is how he has protected me. This is how he has strengthened me. This is how he has carried me through in my life. Now think about David for just a minute. If he's the psalmist that's writing this, You've got an individual who has faced a giant, Goliath. He has faced a king, Saul. He has faced his own family and betrayal, Absalom. He is an individual who has known 
the struggle, both inside the house and out, both military and relationally. He has known what battles are at every emotional level that you and I can engage. David has seen it all. He's experienced it all. And he's come through it all. And David writes to you, my testimony to you. God is my refuge. He is my strength. In him I trust. David speaks to you as a witness, as a testimony that God has brought me through. And therefore, God can bring you through. You say, look, David is just one king among many. David is just one story among many in the scriptures. And besides that, he's Old Testament. He's not even New Testament for us to believe that we should follow such things. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we find that the writer, Paul, speaks about a great cloud of witnesses. He states, since therefore we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. Paul says there is an entire cloud of witnesses who are watching, who have lived what we're living. They've gone through what we've gone through. They have suffered the things that we have suffered, and they are his idea in heaven. And therefore, they have won. They are victors. And if you were to look at their stories, if you, if you read about their lives, then you find that God was there for them. God supplied the needs for them. God drew them from the struggle and to the victory. He says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. David says, I am a witness. God has helped me overcome a giant. He has helped me overcome a king. He has helped me overcome the betrayal of the dearest and deepest wounds within my own family life. David says, God has been my refuge in all of it. He has been my strength through all of it. And he has sheltered me in the midst of it. David speaks as a witness to you and I. And he's not alone. He is surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the scripture tells us that that cloud of witnesses is growing because as believers come to God, then God takes up their struggle with them. If you will, I want you to jump over, if you want, to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, in, in verses 14 and following, it says, Later Jesus appeared to the eleven who were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe all that uh, who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, this is all stuff that you're used to. Jesus rose from the dead. He comes back. He reveals himself to the people. And he says to them, go out and continue to share the gospel. Go out and continue to minister in my name. Go out and do the work that God has called you to engage. But then he says this, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick, and they will get well. Jesus says, listen, I'm sending you out to go and do this amazing work, but I am empowering you. And his statement is, don't worry about the harm that can come. Don't worry about the snake. Don't worry about the poison. Don't worry about the disease, nor the demon. I'm entering the struggle with you. And you will see me working with you. You will see me working side by side with you. Jesus says that's possible. Now, some have taken that passage and they say, well, listen, that passage really doesn't apply to modern Christianity. And then others have taken that passage and they said, well, that passage means that we're all supposed to go grab snakes and grab them and, and, and dance around with them. Both are absolutely wrong. 
That's the devil talking right there. The devil says, take a passage, move it out of its context, and tell folks they can do whatever they please, and God has to do what they want him to. You want to dance with snakes? God has to protect you. That's not true. Do you want to go out and, and uh, share the gospel? Well, you need to be afraid of snakes because even though he says it, it's probably not going to work out for you. Well, that's not true either. It's taking those two sides and creating in them some sort of untruth from the truth that's in the scripture. The scripture actually indicates that the apostle Paul was bit by a snake. Not because he was dancing around with it in a worship service. He was bit by the snake because he was in the midst of the process of going on a mission trip. And God wanted him on that mission trip. He was calling him on that mission trip. And he protected him on that mission trip. But Paul didn't go out to seek the snake. And he didn't shy away from the mission trip because he was afraid of snakes. There's the key. We have these witnesses who show us, whose testimony is written in God's word. It's a cloud of witnesses who speak to us through the written word. God has protected us and he will protect you. He has walked with us and he will walk with you. God will not leave you nor forsake you. And we have a whole witness cloud that is there to share that testimony. Here's what I want you to do for just a moment. I want you to think about two or three people that you think would share this testimony with you. Maybe they already have. Maybe you sat down as a, a grandparent that's talked with you, uh, an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it's a coworker or a friend who said, listen, God held my hand through this. God supported me through this. God strengthened me through this. I, I can think of so many faces and names that I've watched go through different griefs, whether it's the, the death of a child or the death of a spouse or, or a disease or an addiction. And they've said, each time I'm making it because God is good. I'm making it because God has strengthened me. I am making it because God walks with me. He fights with me. And I believe he will protect me. I have witnessed this myself in others. And I pray that I have been a witness of this to some. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in our modern life. Of folks who will tell you of the strength and the beauty and the protection that God gives. Now that means that we shouldn't run out and make light of it and say, all oh, that's bunk and God doesn't care and you need to be afraid because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And we shouldn't run out and also say, all Christians are 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You can do whatever you want to because God has to protect you. What we need to do is say simply what the scripture says. And the psalmist says, I'm telling you, I've lived it. I've seen it. God is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and I trust him him. What about you today? Where is your trust? You say, well, Brother Dave, I'm not sure how to trust because I'm afraid of going too far one side or the other. I don't want to twist the scripture, but I also don't want to be afraid of putting my faith in the scripture. So, so how do I find the balance? The scripture tells us that balance is found when we engage not our will but his. If you take a look at the passage of the testimony of the individual who is sharing with us, he says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. The psalmist writes that there needs to be a dwelling with God. I need to infuse my life into his. I need to commit my life wholly and completely into his arms. I need to give myself over to him. It is not him coming into me. It is me coming into him. If you want to get sheltered, you can't try to place him inside. 
You, you've got to get inside of where he's at. And so he says, I have committed my life. I've given myself wholly and completely over to him. Whatever he wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And, and by the way, if it's David who's writing this, which we believe it is, that makes a lot of sense because he wanted to build a temple for God, which is a good thing. And God said, no, you can't. And so David didn't. David could have looked at God and said, no, 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 I want to do this for you. I'm going to do this for you. I will complete this for you. But David didn't do that. He said, your choice. I'll do exactly what you ask. We need to have that mindset of wanting to do what it is he's called us to do. And one of the telling phrases for me, in, in verse two, he says, my fortress, my God. When, when he states that, it says in, in the King James, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God. That phrase is identical. And what it means is that he is supreme. When I say he is my God, he's not just simply a, a thing that I worship, but he is the thing I worship. He is the consuming fire of my life. He is the singular passion of my day. He is my God. David, if you remember, refused to kill King Saul because God had anointed him. And he said, I won't violate what God has started. I will not get in the way of what God has done. I do not want to step across Saul, not because he loves Saul, but because he relished and respected what God had done. He said, I won't get in the way of that. God is in charge of that. You and I need to pick our battles a whole lot better. You want God to fight for you? Then the truth is, you need to learn that you're fighting for him. When you and I pick our battles, a lot of times it's, it's what we want to see happen. It's the victory that we want to have. This is not that song. We take on the battle that God has selected for us. We take on the charge that God has commanded us to engage. We take on the calling that God alone has given. In Matthew 16, Jesus stated, Go ye therefore. And after he said that, then he said, and these are the signs that will follow them. You don't get the empowerment until you get the obedience. So here's my last question for you tonight. The battle that you're fighting, is it yours or is it his? Who's the one who has taken up the call to war? Was it you or was it God? If it was God, then stand with him, fight with him, walk with him, and find the beauty and power of this passage to be true. Testimonies throughout the scripture defy it, declare it. And those around me who I have personally witnessed have shown it. God is a fighting God. And when we fight with him, Instead of telling him he has to fight with us, we find shelter, we find refuge, we find strength to overcome. I hope that you are picking the right battles and picking them in the right way. I pray that you are standing with God and you know the shelter that only he can give. It's been great to be with you. I hope that you'll join us this Sunday at 1015 here on channel 14 and that you'll engage in worship with us as we sing the praise of our fighting God. Look forward to catching up with you again right here at Second Baptist.